forgot to plug this in, so I'm going to stand here and tap, if that's okay. So I'm going to talk about 10 easy ways to uh, irritate a design team. This is based on an entirely unscientific survey I did with uh, people I know on Twitter, friends and colleagues in the UK. So it's really biased towards in-house sort of product design teams. Um, but I think you'll find a lot of useful things in there for agencies and for tech people too. Um, another thing about this is that a lot of these problems are pretty much unsolvable by the design team alone. You really need help from the business. So I want to give you some ways to try and help the business to care. Because you, I just have this imaginary uh, chief financial officer and you say to him, you've got to really look after your design team. And he's like, what this bunch of beard wearing, latte drinking, bringing dog to work. For, oh, why should I care? This is why. This is why. Well, I love this quote. Uh, this is from a woman called Paola Antonelli. Uh, she's like a cultural critic. She's a curator at the Museum of Modern Art. And she writes a lot about the intersection of design and technology and society. And she says, design is not style. It's not about giving shape to the shell and not giving a damn about the guts. Good design is a renaissance attitude that combines technology, cognitive science, human need, and beauty to produce the something that the world didn't know it was missing. Can you imagine? That's exactly what every startup wants. They want to produce something that the world doesn't know it's missing. And design is the route to this. So this is one thing to tell the, the business and the chief financial officer. Here's something else to tell them. Um, IBM, um, you know IBM, the big blue uh, company, very, very like boring, old, sort of feature-driven computer company. Well, in the last few years, they've spent over £100 million to hire hundreds of designers, and they've completely transformed their business into a design business. So they say that they're user first, not feature first, and it's completely transformed their business. So in the past, the ratio of designers to the rest of the business was one designer to all these other business people. And in the last couple of years, it's moved from one to eight, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and they're not alone. This is a recent uh, InVision survey. And this shows the shift of um, businesses to becoming user first and the shift in the number of the, the, sort of the rest of the business to designer ratio. And it's looking, you know, average about one to nine um, in, um, uh, intercom or one to five. I mean, this is just from publicly available figures. I know that Facebook is quadrupling its designer uh, hiring targets. The big four accountancies in the UK, I don't know what it's like in Amsterdam, so people like Accenture, they're actually buying entire design companies to get access to designers and researchers. In Britain, we have all these challenger banks like um, Monzo and Starling. Uh, they're just sweeping up whole design teams as well. And Capital One, which is a big global bank, again, has been on this massive hiring spree. So there's a real shortage of designers. And this is further... Uh, further um, uh, a bigger problem is because of design education. So again, I'm talking about uh, Britain and America, but design is traditionally taught at art schools, which is quite a strange thing if you think about it. Um, and this means that the designers, they, they don't really learn how to be commercial designers at art school. They have to learn on the job. Very, very few people emerge as like fully fledged commercial product designers. And unless your business has the ability to hire and invest in junior designers, you're going to be battling all of these companies to hire people who have the skills to change your business. And then on top of this, in the UK, the average tenure of a senior or mid to senior designer in our industry is two years. So it makes great commercial sense to attract and retain good people. And this is what you should say to the business when you try to get them to work with you to, make, um, to remove some of these irritations. And as I said, this is not just about designers. This is, um, I don't know if you know the startup here. Um, they talk about, so Lever, uh, they're the, a big startup that helps with the recruitment process. And this guy, he should know. So he says, it's faulty reasoning, especially for tech workers. Tech work is increasingly in demand and employers are gaining more leverage while employers are finding it more difficult and costly to hire. So there's a great business case in keeping your designers happy. Now, what do I mean by design? Um, I'm going to give you a quick primer of the design method um, that I use and the kind of value that it can add. So I talk about this double diamond. I'm sure everybody knows the double diamond. And the way I describe it is build the right thing and build the thing right. So when you want to do build the right thing, you want to understand what it is you need to build. And you do lots of generative research to try and understand the problem space. And then you want to understand that if you've executed correctly. And that's when you do the summative research. Before that, you do lots of ethnographic research to understand and shape the problem space. 
And then, uh, that once you've done all of this, you know you're executing correctly, correctly you start shipping. And I ship, when we ship, um, we do lots of multivariate testing, like different versions to make sure that we've got the right solution. And then once we do this, um, we um, start shipping shippable increments. So we work out what is the very least thing we can do to get value into our customers' hands and start learning. And then we just build up from there. And that takes, well, this is like a huge, um, complex design process. And it's, it's very, it takes a lot of experience to get this right. So I'm going to tell you um, a story about how we did this at Moo. And this is another way you can try and convince the business the, the importance of design. So um, Moo, as you probably all know us for business cards, but actually that's a, one of the smallest parts of our business. Moo um, has a business to business platform where we help co uh, companies like um, Uber and Airbnb and uh, a large sportswear manufacturer, whom I cannot to name, <laughs> and various other companies. We help them manage their marketing collateral and all their print products. Um, and this is called Moo Business Services. So we, um, that business is run by account managers who like, and talk to all the different business clients and find out their needs. And they're a fantastic customer proxy. So they told us that um, if we just had an approval process, they would be able to sell bigger um, projects, they would be able to sell to bigger clients, and it would just generally make their life easier. So we flew out to do a design workshop. That's us working there with the um, account managers and a couple of customers that the account managers knew who particularly needed this approval flow. Um, so we mapped out the whole process. We did customer interviews, again, with the customers who would be selected by the account managers. We sketched out the uh, different steps. Um, we started looking, putting it into our design system, and we thought this is a pretty well thought through solution. However, and I love this quote, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. <laughs> because we thought, actually, do we know that this solution is going to suit everybody? Because we've only talked to like a, a slice of the customer base, and we've talked to the account managers. But really, do we know this, or is this just an assumption? So we thought, we're going to go back to the other part of the double diamond and make sure we're building the right thing. So we took um, all these beautiful designs and we reverted back to sketches. It was a really conscious decision because we've discovered that if you do sketches, people are much more comfortable picking it apart. If you show people a really nicely finished design, I found in my experience, people are less likely to really critique it. But if you show them sketches, people will really get in there and start exploring what the problem is. So we went out to a much wider range of companies to show them this approval flow sketching. So the way approvals work generally is that somebody uses the print, Somebody buys the print, and somebody approves the print. So the model we had from the account managers was quite linear, but we went out to a much wider range of customers, and we discovered, my gosh, this was so complex, unbelievably complex. All different companies seemed to have different approval flows in different ways, and um, different people, even different departments within companies had different problems and different ways of approving it. And we thought, hang on a minute, this approval flow isn't going to work for everybody. What is going to work? And we realized, the first shippable increment was actually just an email because what we ha would have had to build was a huge account and permission system to create this approval flow. So we took a step back and thought the easiest and simple way to solve this problem is to build uh, just a simple email. We get value into the customer's hands and then we can work out like how are they using it. So this was us building the right thing. It wasn't a massive approval flow. It was uh, just a simple email. And then we moved to the next stage of the double diamond. And uh, started to think about executing. So on the left there, oh God, on the right is the original email, on the left is the one that we proposed. But there was so much complexity, even in a simple email. Where should the button be? Should it be active or passive approval? What should the copy say? And at this point, we start moving into execution. This is building the thing right. And the other thing I'd like to point out here is we saved Moo a significant amount of money because you think about the money that it takes to run a full agile team, how long it would take to build this approval flow, and it wouldn't have worked for everybody. So designers not only make money for the business, they save money for the business. So to talk about the next step in this uh, process, we get sat together with the um, product manager, with the developers, and we just got um, various customers to come in and use this email and discuss the problems. And then we all did, took post-it notes, um, and we all, at the end of it, we did a collaborative wash-up where we looked at each of the problems, we defined them, we did an affinity sort into clusters to see what the different um, problems were. And then we talked as a group about how to solve each of these problems. And we did it using this matrix, which is technical difficulty versus value. So this is the way we decide how, what the next shippable increment is going to be. So some things are easy to solve and they're important to the customer. That's what we do first. 
Some things down at the bottom are difficult and nobody wants it, so the question is, why do this? Which is a great tool for taming hippos. I don't know if you know what a hippo is. The highest paid person in the organization. If you have a beastly hippo, do this. <laughs> so, and here's one in action at Moo. So this is the, what I call a design process, a proper end-to-end -end design process where design is involved right from the start all the way through to execution, where it's collaborative, where it's based in customer need. This is what a good design process looks like. This is what makes designers happy. But here's what makes them really unhappy. Number one, designers being asked to color in. That's what I call it. So basically, you've got this team that can uncover unmet needs, they can innovate, they can ensure product market uh, fit, so they can stop you building the wrong thing, and they can make things that are such a joy to use that your customers evangelize about them so much. And actually, that takes the place of marketing. Transfer-wise, actually, instead of marketing, they've tried to put all their effort into the growth team to making the experience so incredible that people tell people. And that way, they drastically reduce their marketing spend. This is what design can do. But unfortunately, often what happens is that we just get given this little slice of the entire process, which is what I call colouring in. And this is the result of a really disempowered or a centralised design team that supports lots of tech teams. And this has so many bad effects. Like the team lacks context, so they make really bad decisions. Morale is low. Your business doesn't get to support, um, to explore different solutions and optimise the solution. And quite often as well, I've seen that the centralised design team, they have sort of a JIRA ticket-based sort of waterfall system. And the rest of the organisation is agile, so the design team become blockers, and then they get even more and more miserable. And then you get this culture of handoffs, where somebody, you, the design team goes to design something, kind of throws it at the developers to build. It's just a disaster. So you end up with something like this, with the design team over there, just throwing things over the wall to the development team, and the development team just can't build it because they don't know what's going on, and the design team isn't basing anything on customer needs. It's a disaster. What you need is this. A unified crew, which is what we have at Moo. And I know I appreciate this is probably difficult to do in an agency, but if you can do this, I know Pivotal Labs actually an agency and they do this really, really well, where the customer comes in and they work as a cross-functional crew to deliver design. So this is what I believe is um, a really good structure to deliver design. And in Moo, we use um, a particular structure called a quad. And a quad is a product person, a designer, um, a developer, and an agile coach. Um, and each one of these people are equal, and they have equal power to, um, to make decisions, although the product manager owns the roadmap. And between them, they um, run the team. Like, let me show you how this works. So we have product, and product shapes um, the future of the product. They're all about vision, and they're all about building the right thing. You have EXD, and we straddle, so UX, um, we, we were called EXD Experience Design, but um, we straddle, they build the right thing, and we help um, validate the value proposition, we help create the vision, but we also craft brilliant experiences, which just puts us at build the thing right. Then you have tech, in this setup, um, they're all about execution and about scalability. And then we have this amazing new thing, which I didn't experience until I worked in government, which is an agile delivery coach, which is like a scrum master on steroids. They're absolutely incredible, if you can get one of these people. And they, um, they facilitate meetings, um, they facilitate retros, and they make sure that the team is functioning and that they're happy and healthy. And between us, we delight customers, we build, run, own, and iterate great products, and we have a very happy team. And if you've got a group of people like this, then you can start doing proper discovery. Um, so this is a, a, a diagram I've stolen from Jeff Patton. So thank you, Jeff, if you're ever watching. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is, um, this is how he, Jeff Patton and Marty Kagan talk about discovery. So you have a group of people, like the Quad, who are cross-functional, and they work in small sprints to uncover these different opportunities. And then they can dismiss a lot of ideas and they move really, really quickly and they can understand market viability, technical viability. And continually, like, lots of ideas will fail and that's okay. And they gradually iterate until they start launching. And then we have potentially shippable software and actually uh, shippable software. This is how you do great design and keep your designers happy. So quite often, your teams will get some of this right, but not all of this. And um, this is what I call a feature factory. This is, well, I don't actually. John Cutler in Hacker Noon, um, he first coined this phrase, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It was a, he called it a feature factory. Basically, that you're doing lots of agile practice, but it's just more like agile theater. You're just sort of shipping stuff. You don't really know why. And the way I like to think about this is, I don't know if you've heard of cargo cults. 
Mm. So during the uh, Second World War, America had all these forward bases in uh, the Pacific Islands. So from the view of the islanders, like, these people just turned up with these things, these planes, and all this magical stuff like Coca-Cola appeared, and then these people vanished. So the islanders really, really wanted Coca-Cola. I'm massively simplifying this, but they wanted Coca-Cola and some of this great stuff, and they thought, right, well, they had planes. Maybe if we build a plane, all this stuff will come back, or maybe if we build this kind of satellite dish, this stuff will come back. Here's another example of it. And I think this is actually how sometimes some businesses do agile, that, you know, if we have lots of stand-ups, somehow magically agile is going to happen, and it doesn't. <laughs> so John Cutler identifies this as feature factory, and I call it agile theatre. And he says you can recognise um, a feature factory by these different, um, these different measurements. So first of all, if you have no objectives, so I call this, you do projects, not products. Basically, you just do stuff. Uh, you don't know what objectives you're trying to meet, you don't know what results you can expect, you don't know what you're going to shift, you're just putting stuff out into the world. Another sign of this is no metrics. So if the team, and again this is a unified team, they don't measure their work, they don't know if it's effective, or if the measurement is done in isolation just by product management, then you don't know if you're successful. You're just, because you measure unit of success as delivering a feature rather than having some really useful outcome. And then success theatre, so you, have, you celebrate the fact you've delivered, not the fact you've actually changed something or made your customer brilliant. You have velocity, so velocity becomes the prime metric rather than um, like, you know, making a customer really happy or shifting some kind of metric. You just measure velocity and everyone's really excited because you've got great burn down charts. This is meaningless. Uh, you don't acknowledge failure or learn from it. Um, so features don't get removed, they just hang around and you end up with this kind of like Frankenstein monster of a site. Um, you obsess about prioritization because you have find up with like, people just argue to get stuff on the roadmap because nobody's really quite sure why they're doing stuff and prioritization becomes a battle. And then you chase upfront revenue. So you always think, right, that you end up doing these projects that you think um, it's going to make lots and lots of money and you just stag, sort of shove something into the project and it shouldn't even be there. And this results in feature creep and bloated products. So this is another way to really irritate your design team. Do like this fake agile theatre and become a feature factory. Number three, you do all of this. And another consequence is that you ship and forget. So you just see the team just put something out there and they forget about it. Um, they don't understand the impact of new features, and if you have lots of usability problems, and if they I've seen this so often, usability problems, and because it's, everyone's obsessing about velocity and prioritization, you don't go back and fix things. So you end up with this seat, the horrible bloated site, you can't learn and evolve, and often you'll see the team doing lots and lots of upfront design, often in a silo, so that they can iterate and do user research, because they know once something is shipped, it's just out there and, it's, and it never gets iterated. And then you see stakeholders having to shoehorn stuff in because they know it's their one chance to get something out there because the team doesn't iterate. And then you get everyone blocked and everyone argues about their pet feature. And then you start accruing tech debt because you're just sticking things in there, not fixing it. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> so what you should be doing is something like this. I mentioned shippable increments earlier. A shippable increment is when you just put out a tiny, tiny bit of a feature. You work out what is the smallest you can do, thing you can do to get value into the customer's hands and to start learning. And then you observe how it's, it works. And then you um, ch change the feature or you add to it. And then you gradually move forward. So rather than just like shipping one huge thing and forgetting about it. And if you don't do this and you work in all the terrible ways that I've described, this means that over time, the team will gradually grind to a halt. And this happens, nothing customer facing gets shipped. And I've seen this several times. The team eventually runs into so much tech debt, they're paralyzed. Or you're in endless meetings where no one can agree to do what to do next. Or then you have someone says, OK, look, let's just do this quick project. We'll get us revenue, and that will give us money to fix all the tech debt. But the tech debt is so bad, this project that should take three months takes a year, and it causes more tech debt. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> and, um, so once this starts happening, if the team becomes paralyzed and people start leaving in droves. And once you, um, once you get to this point, you'll need somebody visionary to come in and start fixing irritations one to three, and you'll probably need to do this while hiring, which leads to my next irritation, hiring. Hiring is often a really, really terrible experience on both sides. So to hire well, you need clarity, and you need clarity about how your organization expects people to behave. So you hear people talking about hiring for cultural fit, what they really mean is hiring people I like or people like me. 
What you need to do is really understand your culture very well so that you can hire people that complement your culture, not just another clone of you. And this moves us away from the tendency to hire people that think the same and then towards a company that has people of diverse backgrounds, perspectives and ideas that complement your culture. So I say it's a bit like this. <laughs> so I, just, I describe rec uh, recruiting as human Tetris. So you're trying to get the right blend of skills, the right blend of personalities and gel them into a team. And then the added complexity is that people sit in two teams. They sit in our design team, but they also sit in their crew. And that's pretty much what my career at Moo has been like for probably for the last six months, is trying to gel this team together and understand what our values are. And we're still hiring, if anyone's interested. <laughs> so the next um, problem is the, you need a clarity around your ad. I love this. <laughs> it's either genius or terrible. I think it's genius. <laughs> so if you don't have clarity around the role, the first thing that's going to go wrong is your ad. <laughs> It's often immediately obvious that the company knows they need design, but they don't really know what kind of design, or they've heard about that one person that codes and designs and researches, and they want one of them, or they're trying to squeeze a lot of work out of one person. So if you're going to hire someone to do visual design and strategy and coding and research and run A-B tests, you're either going to pay a lot of money for that one person, or you have ensured that you have the support and infrastructure around these people, or you're going to have somebody that's going to be terrible at quite a lot of their jobs. Also, if you're hiring for a design leadership position and you see you expect that person to be hands-on too, that shows to me that you're not ready to invest in design leadership. And then if you're hiring for a product person, but you see that a large part of that product person's role is like research and design activities, it shows to me that you don't see design as an equal partner and that you've handed off the strategy and thinking entirely to product. And all of these are going to make it hard to attract quality people. So if you're hiring, I'd say, Invest time in looking at how companies do things well. How do they work? And then get your organization to do some organization design before you start hiring designers so you get the best out of them. And um, this is, I, there was a recent report, the State of UX in 2017, and I love this quote. Many UX designers started their careers as information architects, visual designers, strategists. We're used to seeing job titles changed from time to time as companies understand the depth of our work and accommodate trends and market needs. So I can really feel the pain of the HR teams because they have no idea who they're hiring. Is that an information architect or a UX designer? Or a UI? Ah. So <laughs> it's very difficult to know who to hire. So what you should do is start with clarity about the problem this person's going to be coming in to solve. And that's going to show you the shape of the person. And then um, the final type of clarity is what can they actually work on and solve? So another great quote, is organizations don't want to hire someone to do a thing. They want to hire a magician who can wear every hat and solve every problem. God, that's so familiar. So if you're hiring designers, um, what you should be doing is try and understand what do they need to fix? What can they fix? What support do they have? And you have to make sure that the rest of the organization understands that designers are not a magic bullet to their problems. So that's the hiring solver, the first part of the job at. Uh, at. The second thing that often goes wrong is onboarding. Um, so at Moo, we actually thought this is a, a, such a key part of getting people set up for success. And we spent a lot of time designing the process. In fact, that's the, the result of our, one of our workshops about onboarding. So we work out what tools you need. Um, they spend time understanding the product. Um, they meet the rest of the team. We make sure they understand metrics and they have training in metrics and data. We have lunches with key people when we set up a buddy system. And we try to make that onboarding experience look really amazing and positive so that people just like, after a month or two, they're just soaring. And I saw, just when I was preparing this talk, I saw this really interesting um, um, tweet. And I thought, oh, God, it's so true. So this is my friend Peter, who's just moved to Google. And I thought, what a great quote. Observation, there's a chance, a good chance with new starters and big companies that genuine concern and confusion about process and ways of working gets misdiagnosed as imposter syndrome. I thought, yeah, that's really true. Actually, I hadn't realized the importance of onboarding people until I was at Moo. So that's another thing I urge you to do. And um, this is another one. Another friend of mine has gone to Google as well. They're on a hiring spree. And Google have put this really lovely idea together, which is called the blue dot. So basically, if you start and you're feeling a bit lost, you, you see somebody with a blue dot in their badge, that means that they're like a judgment-free buddy and you can go and ask them anything and they'll help you. So again, that's something we're going to try and put into place at Moo. I thought, what a lovely idea. So the next irritation uh, is no future. So you, I touched on this earlier. I keep seeing now um, senior product jobs or like chief product officer jobs 
um, basically describing about 80% of my job. And I'm realizing that the market's changed and there's becoming no route to seniority as senior parts of the job are kind of being subsumed into product. So if you really want designers to sit around, stick around and have a long career with you, you should start defining career ladders that define what's expected in the role and how to move to the next level and make sure that there's not a ceiling that they hit. And these career ladders should reflect both hard and soft skills. So what is the criteria to become a vice president? What's the expected behaviours? What technical skills do you need? What leadership skills do you need? You need to make sure these are all clarified and that everybody understands because otherwise it becomes really confused and people think people get promoted out of favouritism rather than being good at their job. You need to be transparent and fair about this. And also if your team are leaving because they're not supported by professional development or feedback assessments or engagement surveys, um, it's because the questions don't tie back to what the organisation values. So you really have to make sure that your organisation values designs and that like, runs through all the sort of interactions that you have with them. Um, the next irritation, research is a struggle. Oh, I've been so many places when I was uh, starting my career that it was just so difficult to get research done. And it was so obvious, like, why don't you check that somebody can actually use your product? <laughs> Even now, it's like, why, why don't we check that people actually want your product? Um, so you might detect a theme through this presentation, which is collaborative teams, building things that solve real problems, that are commercially focused, that are customer focused, and that continually learn. And you can't do any of this without excellent research. Um, so, so many businesses just don't understand research at all. I've seen UX research get put in the marketing uh, department because it, they've got market research there. I don't understand that. And I have the dreadful quote that just drives me insane. Um, well, if, you, if we asked people what they want, they'd have said a faster horse. First of all, Edison didn't actually say that, I've discovered. <laughs> and secondly, it just shows such a fundamental lack of understanding of design research because you don't ask people what they want. You observe them, um, you do contextual inquiry, and you iterate towards this, um, solving the problem. You don't just simply ask people. So if somebody says that to you, you know they don't get research. <laughs> and um, so product design research, you have to make sure that the organization understands it's different to market research, it's different to analytics, and that you need a blend of qual and quant to make great products. Um, and you need to be very clear where this should sit. It should be sitting with the design and product teams. It should be embedded. And you should be making sure that the design and product teams understand research and can execute some research themselves. And I love this quote. I wonder if anyone can guess who this came from. I was really surprised. Oh. Uh, it actually came from Jeff Bezos, which I was astounded at. And um, he, I think this, because you think of Amazon as being incredibly data-driven and, you know, every decision they made is doing multivariate testing. And Jeff Bezos says this. And I think part of this is because the analytics are a lagging metric. They show you things that have happened, whereas qual is a leading metric because it can show you things that might be. So it's really important to have the blend of both. And also analytics only shows you um, the what and the how. The qual shows you the why. So bringing them all together is incredibly powerful. So my next iteration, iteration, iteration is meetings. So um, I don't know if you've heard the expression maker time and manager time. Uh, this was first described by the very excellent Paul Graham. And he talked about two types of schedule. So the manager schedule, which is generally split into hours or half hours, and it's all about meetings. And this is the, the sort of schedule for bosses. And then you have the schedule for people who make things, where you really have to work in chunks of um, days or even half a day. And when those two kind of come together, um, they really conflict and they cause a huge amount of problem. Because if you've got a meeting, say, at 11 o'clock, it pretty blows out your morning, doesn't it? I, I particularly find this. Um, so most powerful people are on the manager schedule, and most designers are on the maker schedule. Trying to get those two aligned is very difficult, but it's really important to have meetings. Uh, this is a brilliant blog post by Learning by Shipping. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them. They've got a great Medium account. I'd check it out. And they say that the, when you're building a company, the most important tool you have to create a culture of shared values is meetings. Because when you bring people together, the only way that they're going to operate as a team is to spend time talking and listening and understanding their different perspectives. And unless everyone shares the same background and experiences, there's no way that you can become a high-performing team without meeting, sharing, and learning together. So no, you can play all the ping pong you want. It's not going to substitute for a meeting. So you need to start thinking about how to change meetings. Um, so maybe using anti-meetings, as I call it, something like Slack, uh, or actually using meetings to work together and to build a shared understanding so that you don't have these meetings which are just people telling you things. Meetings instead are about working. And then you have a regular cadence of meetings, so if ideally in the morning, 
Um, so I love this. This was a survey which came out like last month when I was preparing for this. Meetings are the biggest waste of time. This is for all employees in the UK, not just designers. So to solve it, I think we should look for ways to maximize collaboration. So I mentioned the quad or doing discovery together. That's going to remove the burden on meetings to communicate. And then meetings are events where the team comes together and work happens rather than me telling things to you. Um, and then group chat, that delivers a sense of communication without trying to, um, you know, just removing people from the work they're doing. So group chat, like Slack, is really useful. And there's one other thing that's really important for meetings. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Project Aristotle. This is a, a, an image from a long-form New York Times article. Um, and Google wanted to try and understand what made a team really, really high performing. So like Google being Google, um, they, they formed a team of like PhDs, people with like all these brilliant minds and sent them out to gather data. And they spent about six months gathering all the data and they couldn't find a commonality between the teams that performed well. Some were remote, some weren't, some were this, you know, um, using metrics in different ways. Some were people all at the same level, some had a hierarchy. And they couldn't find any common reason why some teams were performing really well and some weren't. So they dig a little bit deeper and they found that the teams where they felt safe to communicate and they felt safe to fail and they could speak their minds without feeling that they might embarrass themselves, those teams were the ones which were the highest performing. And they coined the phrase psychological safety. So it's a safe space where you can just be yourself and you can communicate without fear. And that's what you need to make a team effective and that's what you need to make meetings effective. And I found another fantastic quote, actually, which um, linked to this. Um, this. I thought, God, that really resonated. Look at the amount of likes that got. Isn't that incredible? And she said, funny how working in a diverse team with people who are kind, supportive, and appreciative gives your productivity and self-worth a massive boost. Do not underestimate the importance of safe, welcoming teams and setting people up for success. And I was like, oh, I'm going to grab this one off Twitter. <laughs> so the next thing that irritates people is uh, the space. Um, when I was working at the Government Digital Service, we had this, we first of all got moved into this terrible uh, office right in the middle of London, and it had carpet on the walls, so we couldn't put post-it notes on the walls. So I started putting the post-it notes on the window, and a man from facilities came to me and said, you can't put the post-it notes on the window, and I said, why not? And he said, because it'll stop them being bomb-proof. <laughs> I mean, what? The, the post-it notes are incredibly powerful. I mean, like, yeah, like the IRA, you know, all they need is some post-it notes, job done. Yeah, so so, so um, when I um, talk to facilities about needing a creative space, you know, I think this is what facilities people hear. They think this is what I'm asking for. <laughs> oh, or this, or this, there's lots of slides, or this. These are, all, these are all different agencies in London, or this. This is actually Moo, by the way, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Actually, what I'm asking for is not all of this. What I'm asking for is walls where I can put stuff on. And I think that's what every designer needs. I don't need slides. I need working walls. And walls are so important because they make it simple to see and critique work. It means you can design in the open. And then when you're designing, I think there's almost like levels when you look at something. So when you're designing a page, you're really close and you're just thinking about that page. It's really important to take a step back and think about the ecosystem and how things connect together. And you can't do that on a screen. You need a wall. And by able to get this sort of like perspective, you can like have this macro view that see, it helps you bring consistency, it helps you bring simplicity when you see things being repetitive, um, it helps you see connections, it helps you um, empower design thinking, it allows you to sense make when you see things up visible like this. And because we have this scale, we can see patterns and affinities really easily. So it's really, really important for me to have a wall because it gives you this holistic sort of map of the world of your design. And you also use the walls like a physical container, which allows you to bring the team together and you can facilitate dialogue. Um, you can sift through people's thoughts and opinions, it makes the design process transparent, and you can argue your thoughts and assumptions from this kind of bigger vantage point, and you end up with much sol more solid thinking as a result. So walls are really important, not slides, walls. And walls, and this, this sort of space that you work in, I was thinking about this as well. Um, I saw this other quote, your work environment conveys a message about what you value, who you are, and where you are going. Um, and I spoke at Mind the Product recently, and um, a lady from IBM, Sarah Nelson, and she's a designer, but she's in charge of kind of space and culture. And she had this wonderful quote, space defines a culture, culture shapes the space. I was kind of pondering this. And then I left my office to come here, 
And the, there's a shop opposite my office, and I don't, you can't really see it because it's, they've, they've got black on black, so it's not a great picture. But what that says is, place shapes behavior, behavior over time is culture. And I thought, gosh, that's really interesting, isn't it? Like, your space and your behavior is your culture. And that got me thinking what the next irritation is, which is culture, that's a Petri dish culture. Do you see what I did there? <laughs> so culture is the biggest and most overarching, difficult to fix irritation of all. So everything I've talked about here really is your culture. And culture is behaviors, systems, and practices, and they're connected by an overarching set of values. And you start to have a problem when all these things are not aligned. So a company can be talking about work-life balance, and then they don't offer paid paternal leave, or they expect people to stay late consistency, and they don't go home to their families. So that's a behavior systems gap. Or your uh, company might say, yes, we're a learning organization, and we develop people, but then they don't give you time off to take classes or any budget. So that's a system behaviors gap. Or then your company says, oh, we really value consensus builders, and then they promote that one pain in the arse who's arguing in every meeting, and that's a behavior practices gap. And you kind of, you, without being, um, sometimes um, you just know this problem, even without, you know, I'm being very explicit here, but sometimes you're in an organization and you just feel things aren't aligned, and it's a really uncomfortable place to be. Um, because you really need to understand the behaviors that are expected through the organization, and then the organization needs to identify the systems and processes that are going to help these uh, culture and values be expressed and sustained. And so many organizations just don't do this. And so many people leave. And they don't just leave. Um, they talk about you. So I don't know what it's like in Amsterdam, but in London, my gosh, we have so many design meetups and everybody knows each other. And you know the places not to work. <laughs> and then you have glass doors. I don't know if you've got glass doors uh, in Amsterdam, so people put the reviews, and there's talks and conferences and drinks, and people really know where the bad places are. So if you get points one to nine wrong, you know, people might leave. But if you get this last point, if you get culture wrong, people might not come to you in the first place. It's really, really important, and you'll lose out on the people who can really transform your business. Now, I've given you um, irritations one to 10, but when I was at the Telegraph, I discovered, um, when we were doing um, quant research, that people are more likely to click on a, a list that are an odd number, which is why you get BuzzFeed, like, 27 ways your cat is fantastic. <laughs> you know? So I thought I'd learn from that, and I'll give you a bonus invitation, <laughs> um, which is micromanagement. <laughs> I don't know if you've, this is a wonderful website. It's called Hovering Art Directors. <laughs> So they're, they're, you just picture after picture of hovering art directors. <laughs> so one of the ways we try to stop this at Moo is to give a, a sort of structure in place that we don't sweat the small stuff. We're not like they're hovering over people's shoulders um, to um, define buttons. We, do, uh, we have a design system, so I'm sure you're all familiar with Brad Frost's Frost work, but just in case you aren't, let me just talk you through. So this is uh, one of our pages, and when you split it apart, you know, you remove the content, that becomes a template, and the template is a holder for all these different organisms. When you split them apart, these become molecules, and then finally you have atoms. This is called atomic design, so this is how we work at Moo, and we build all of this up into a design library, which looks like this. We use uh, Sketch and Envision, so this means that we have this common core components, and everybody in the design team pulls in these common core components, which means that we can be autonomous, we can work at speed, and we still have consistency. So it looks like this. So we call this a uh, Moo design system, Moods, see what we did there? Um, and it's a common, um, it's a common uh, code library as well, so we work very closely with the development team. and They build everything so that it becomes shareable, reusable, React components, and our design is shareable and reusable as well, which means that that kind of colouring in part pretty much does itself, and our design team spends most of their time at the other part of the double diamond trying to understand product market fit and innovation. <laughs> Um, and we also, there's another, um, we have an icon library that we share with marketing as well, so that we have consistency in all our marketing emails uh, and anything else that just goes out that doesn't come from our team. But there's another um, aspect of micromanagement that I wanted to talk about as well. Um, 
three years ago, I went to Chile for the weekend, which I still laugh about. And um, I was, had a year of saying yes. I got asked to talk. Um, this is how I got into talking. I just thought, right, I'm just going to say yes to everything. And um, I started off doing a, a Ladies at UX, and it just snowballed. And I got invited to go to Chile for the weekend. I went, yes! So um, I got it was 26 hours there, 27 hours back. And um, it was brilliant. And I was there for two days. And my first night there, so I have to tell you this story, my first night there... Um, it was an earthquake, because I hadn't realised, like, the Andes are just insane. It's like, you fly over to Argentina, it's flat, and the Andes do this. And um, so I should have realised that, you know, Chile is earthquake prone. I kind of knew it, but I'd forgotten. So I was in the 20th story of my hotel, and I woke up, and there was an earthquake. And I was like, oh, my God. So I phoned reception, and I said, there's an earthquake. And she goes, yes, we know. That's my Chilean accent. Yes, we know. And I said, what should I do? And she goes, go back to bed. And I said, I can't go back to bed. So I got on Twitter, and I was so shaken up, and I tweeted, oh my gosh, I've just been in an earthquake, and I got two responses. Uh, the first one was from a, a UX designer that I worked beside, and he said, oh my gosh, are you okay? And the other one was from the head of product at the Telegraph that I was working off, and he just said, number, question mark. And I thought, that is proof positive that EX, uh, UX designers have empathy, and product people are all about metrics. <laughs> <laughs> But when I was there as well, I, met, I had a privilege of seeing a man called Rafi Krikorian, who was ex-Twitter and Uber, and he's now the chief technical officer of the Democratic National Congress. And he did this wonderful talk where he kind of exemplified what I'd been as my management practice, but I hadn't really been explicit about. And he talked about um, giving people autonomy, taking a, a step back, and turning people into leaders of their own selves. And he quoted this book which uh, I would urge everybody to read. It's by um, his, David Marquette, was a, a naval commander, and he passed to the top of his like, nuclear submarine training course, and he was told he was going to get the best um, ship in the fleet, and he was actually given the worst, and it was because his sort of uh, management ethos was about turning followers into leaders and giving people autonomy. So he took that ship from being the worst performing to the best performing using these methods. So this is what makes a, a great organisation, a great culture, is giving people the ability to be autonomous and make their own decisions while giving them the guide rails to operate in. And I'll thank you there. <laughs> Thank you for that, Pleasure. and thank you for putting those slides, uh, being critical <laughs> of those, because that's really cargo culture, right? Oh yes, I know, we have a slide, we're going to be creative. Yeah, yes. we're going to be creative, we're going to yeah. be happy in our work. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, uh, there were a lot of questions, I, I, I'm not sure we can do them all, so maybe you can be on Twitter and uh, Absolutely, reply. and I'll, I'll be around this evening and you know, ask me anything, of course, it'd be a pleasure. I, I, a question I liked was like, do you know of any irritations that the business or other departments uh, might have that designers need to be aware of? Oh, yes, uh, it's absolutely. About working oh, together. Yes. Uh -huh. it's from Michael Heistrich. Yes, absolutely. And um, people that call themselves a design genius. Uh, people who say things like, oh, you know, they just don't get it. I used to work beside a designer who did that, and we were pitching to a client, and the client had some great questions, and after, he was like, oh, they just don't get it. I mean, I'm a great designer, and, oh, and I was just like, oh, God, you're horrible. You know, <laughs> we're a partnership, and we should yeah. be commercial, but people, yeah, so that's, people call themselves design geniuses and who feel they don't need to do research and don't need to bring the business along with them. Yes. No, and the client should be convinced, just... Yeah, it's just listen to me, because yeah, I'm a genius. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> You are at a company that already seems to be so UX-minded. It was always in so many slides. I've seen Moo as a great example. So where, where lies your challenges if you're working now? Oh, we still have lots of challenges. Um, we're still... Um, so we're still working through some technical debt. Um, we have scaled massively, uh, which is great. But then that brings its own problems of culture because you've suddenly got... We've, I mean, nearly tripled in size very, very quickly. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, we've gone global, so there's other cultural problems. Um, so there's a lot of work to do kind of organisational design and culture design to make sure... Because Moo is a wonderful place. It's a great place to work so that we don't lose that. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the challenges, I think. And then um, what's next for Moo? You know, yeah. that's the other thing is, like, the world isn't just business cards. If you think of the sort of S-curve of, you know, products, you know, we're probably reaching the top of saturation. So as a design team, we're looking at what's next. And yeah. that's really fascinating. There was actually also a question from Peter Boersma about this technical debt. He said, who's responsible for all this technical debt wow, I know. versus customer-facing work, like new work? And what is the role of designers in, in this debt that you might have? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I am, it's a really good question. I think it's um, trying to... 
we have to make the case to do customer facing things uh, and, you know, and to balance out the technical debt or to look at technical debt. Um, so when we, have, we work with OKRs, so we, I don't know if people know OKRs, it's a no. way, uh, it's organisational uh, uh, key results, sorry, objectives and key results. Uh, it's a, a management technique from um, sort of Silicon Valley, we've started using it. So everybody in the organisation gets objectives and key results and that gets everyone going in the same direction. So our job is design. Um, is to represent the customer and to say that you know this is we we have to do this, but we really you know we have to fix the technical debt, but we also have to do this to make the customer happy and yeah. use data and evidence to make the case. And we work with the product managers to um, make sure that they kind of the almost designed it, I would call yeah. it, and the improvements gets added to the roadmap and that we iterate. So it has to be a balance, and our our job is to be the voice of the customer and make that case for the design to be iterated or launched or for design debt to be um, worked on. Yeah, so you were, because you were also talking about like these designers are expected to solve every problem oh, yes, yes. possible. And, uh, and well, I, I can imagine what can designers do to stay sane? Because, <laughs> yes. like, because uh, it's, it's a very, very overwhelming industry we work in. It so. is, isn't it? And we're expected to know more all the time. Yeah. You know, like I was sort of looking in preparation for this, I was looking at job ads and I was like, my God, do they really expect people to like great them CSS and, you know, JavaScript and code and do HTML and build prototypes that could potentially be shipped? I, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's really difficult, isn't it? I think we need to be sort of educating organizations and, um, yeah, it's a really difficult one. And then the other problem is that at the senior levels like me, um, lots of that work seems to be gone to product. And I feel like we kind of get attacked from both ends. We're expected to know a huge amount, yet... There is kind of a glass ceiling for us. And I don't know the answer. I think talking about it's really good. And yeah. trying to educate um, people to understand, you know, what's, what's acceptable in a job ad and to un and just get people to understand what's acceptable in workplace practice. And yeah, I don't know, unionize. I'm only there were joking. also questions <laughs> about the, the quads you were mentioning yes, from, uh, from uh, Hidde de Vries. He said, if you work in quads, mm -hmm. does that mean that developers have a wide variety of tasks? And are there any yeah, well, we, it, so we have uh, teams, development teams, which are about seven to nine, and we have the lead developer who's in that quad. And yes, they do have a wide variety of tasks, and the quad as a group discusses what they're going to work on next. And and can we think about UX kind of skills yeah. too? You're expected? Well, they need to be UX friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in the double diamond I showed, so when we're looking at build the right thing and we're very like open uh, research, we wouldn't really expect the developers to be taking part in that. But once we start executing, we would expect at least one developer, some more, to come and observe the research and work on our, work with us to like what should we ship next, and that's a collaborative decision. So yes. And, and do they get to teach you like UX kind of practices uh, <laughs> for, for developers? No, no, we should. But no, we um, we hire people who want to be collaborative like this. So that's one of the kind of categories that we hire for. And on the career ladders, that's something we promote as well. That you have, um, you care about the customer, and you want to do the best thing for the customer. And you have you're open to like different kinds of um, collaboration practices to make these decisions. Okay. Thank you very much. It would be great if you can go to Twitter to, uh, to course, ask some questions yeah, for the other questions. Thank you so much thank for you. having me. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> thank you.